Okay, so welcome to the, the first talk, I guess. Um, uh, right, so I noticed as I was uh, looking through the room that there are lots of experts in here, and this will not be a talk for the experts. So if you are, you can uh, go open up your browser tab or something like that. Um, so I'm going to discuss in these three, uh, in these three talks uh, the Gaussian isoparametric inequality. which is an inequality uh, sort of at the intersection, I guess, of, of uh, probability uh, geometry and analysis and some of its consequences. Um, I do want to say in advance that I have never mastered the art of uh, monitoring the chat uh, while speaking. And so if you do have questions, then please do uh, unmute yourself and interrupt. Um, so, uh, maybe let me start at the, at the very, very beginning uh, to say that, you know, an isoparametric inequality, by an isoparametric inequality, I mean uh, a lower bound on surface area or perimeter in terms of volume or area. Measure, I guess. Um, the classical example being sort of the one from antiquity, which is, you know, if you have, a, if you want to, uh, you know, make a hundred square meters for your goat to graze on, and you want to minimize the cost of building the fence, then the cheapest option is to make a circle, right, as opposed to some other shape. Okay, uh, this being, this inequality being represented by the, uh, the inequality uh, that the perimeter of any subset of R2 is bigger than two times square root pi times the square root of the area, right? So the inequality is very nice, but uh, the real meaning is captured by uh, the knowledge of which sets extremize the set, right? So this is uh, with equality for uh, circles. Okay, so this is not, of course, what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the Gaussian version of this. So I think the first thing that I have to do is tell you um, what I mean by, okay, so first of all, okay, I, I hope that we all know what I mean by the Gaussian measure. So I'm going to be working in Rn and gamma n, which I'll usually just write gamma because we'll know what n is, is going to be the standard Gaussian measure that is centered and uh, with unit covariance. And uh, you may not know uh, what I mean by Gaussian perimeter or Gaussian surface area. So that's the first thing I want to define. And let me first do it by drawing a picture. So if I have a subset of Rn, I want to think of the Gaussian surface area as being basically the Gaussian measure of, oh, it's too easy to accidentally press the erase button on this thing. Okay. The Gaussian measure of an infinitesimally thin shell around the set, okay? So uh, the definition that we will take for now, and I'll, I'll tell you about a different definition on Friday, which is sort of better in some respects, but this one will we'll do for today. Um, the Gaussian perimeter or Gaussian surface area of a subset, that's a gamma superscript plus of A, um, is, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to take the Gaussian measure of a slightly inflated set, so here B2N, uh, let's see, this zoom window is covering up my colors. Okay. This B2N is the unit Euclidean ball. And by the plus here, I mean the Minkowski sum where A plus B is the set of all points that can be written as the sum of a point uh, from A and a sum and a point from B. Okay, so this set that I've written here is you basically, you take your original set A and you inflate it uh, in the Euclidean distance by a, a distance H. Okay, and then I'm gonna subtract the measure of the original set. And that gives me the measure of this, uh, this thing that I've drawn here, right? Okay, but I want to make this infinitesimal, so I'm gonna divide by H and then set h to zero and I'll take the limit. Okay. 
So I hope this makes sort of some sense geometrically as, as a, a notion of Gaussian perimeter. Maybe I'll just say, if you feel like Googling this, uh, that this thing is sometimes called the Minkowski content. Um, and if you want to be extra specific, what I've defined for you is the uh, uh, lower outer Minkowski content, lower because I took the limb in here as opposed to the limb soup, and outer because I expanded my set outside instead of inside. Uh, this turns out to be the uh, most convenient uh, choices for what I'm going to tell you next, but of course you can also look at the other ones. Um, I also want to make a, a small remark about this, that uh, one other natural definition of Gaussian surface area would be something like this. Uh, I have my set A and I integrate on its boundary the Gaussian density with respect to the sort of n minus one dimensional surface measure, right? Um, let's call this gamma tilde plus of A. These two definitions are not the same, uh, but they turn out to coincide for sort of any you know, natural set that you can think of. So uh, I'll maybe call it an exercise that if you have a nice enough set, let's say that uh, if your set has uh, Lipschitz boundary, then these two things agree. Okay. All right. Um, now, let me tell you what the main inequality is that I'm going to tell you about for the next uh, three lectures. So uh, this is a theorem which is, was proved in the 70s independently by uh, Krista Burrell and by Sudakov and Cyrilson. And um, I'm going to write it first in the inequality form, okay, which is maybe not the most intuitive way to see it. And then I'll, I'll say what it means geometrically in a second. So uh, for every measurable subset of Rn, I can lower bound the Gaussian perimeter by a specific function of the Gaussian measure. Okay, this is some explicit uh, function. So the function I uh, of X is, well, I'm gonna write it as a composition of two other functions and I'll tell you what those functions are. So here phi is the one dimensional Gaussian density And capital phi is uh, the one dimensional Gaussian cumulative distribution function. And uh, just to sort of get rid of the boundary cases, um, I'm going to actually, so phi is going to be defined on the extended real line, right? So usually phi is defined on the real line and it maps to the open interval zero one, but I'm going to define it. Uh, for plus infinity and minus infinity also uh, taking the obvious values. So phi of minus infinity is zero and phi of plus infinity is one. And then this defines I on the closed interval zero one to, uh, to R, I guess. Okay. Uh, and if you draw a little plot of what I looks like, it's concave, it's symmetric around a half looks maybe something like this, okay. All right, so that's the uh, the inequality version, right? So again, it's a lower bound on surface area in terms of the, the measure of a set. Um, the sort of the geometric interpretation comes from knowing what are the cases when this achieves equality. So uh, this is sharp and equality is attained or half spaces and what I mean by a half space is a set of form uh, defined by linear inequality 
set of all x in Rn with a x small than or equal to b. Okay. Um, now, uh, okay, I'll, to explain why this is the case, so first of all, the Gaussian measure is a, a product measure and it's rotationally invariant. So it's enough to consider half spaces which are just perpendicular to the first coordinate axis. And then it's enough to really consider them only in R, right? Because, uh, because Rn is just, I mean, if my set is a product set of a, a subset of R times Rn minus one, then its Gaussian measure is just the Gaussian measure of the, the set in R and its Gaussian surface area is just the surface area of the set in R. So, uh, so in R, if I take a half space in R as a set of the form, um, you know, minus infinity, let's say, up to, let's say, A. Maybe I'll call it B just to be consistent with the line before. The Gaussian measure of this thing is phi of B, right? That was what phi was defined to be. Okay, and the Gaussian surface area of this thing is little phi of B, right? Uh, because the Gaussian surface area, this is the density at the endpoint, right? So I guess I'm, uh, I'm using the, uh, the exercise where I, I claimed that this thing was the, um, the you know, integral on the boundary of the density, right? So the density is only one point. Okay, and of course you see now that uh, the relationship between these two things, right? Is that uh, the bottom one is little phi of capital phi inverse of the top one, right? So I, okay. So half space is attained for, sorry, equality is attained for half spaces. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna prove this for you right now, but I, I will at some point. I wanna tell you maybe first, so the most classical, historically the first application of this and why it was sort of even considered now, Radek is going to tell you in his lectures how this is an obsolete point of view and you should do things uh, using different tools, but, uh, but I think it's still instructive because it, it, it shows the meaning of the inequality. Okay, so the application is towards concentration of measure. For Gaussians, okay, so let me tell you the, the punchline first and then, I'll, and then I'll show you how it's connected. So I call this corollary one, was that for every Lipschitz function, let's say L Lipschitz, okay, you have concentration of this function around its median. So I'll write it like this, the probability that F of Z is bigger than the median plus T this is for every t is bounded by the Gaussian tail at t, which by a classical inequality is bounded by e to the minus t squared over two. Okay, and the notation that I'm using here is this is the median of f. And whenever I write a z, I mean a random variable distributed according to the Gaussian measure. So this is the probability with, with respect to the Gaussian measure. The median is also with respect to the Gaussian measure. Um, by the way, the median is unique because continuous functions have unique medians when the, the measure is fully supported, it's connected support. Um, okay, so this is, uh, uh, I, I wanna emphasize here actually, I should have uh, said this before when, when I pointed out the inequality. This is a statement about functions on Rn, okay? Every Lipschitz function on Rn satisfies this inequality, but the letter N does not appear anywhere in the inequality itself, right? So this is really something which is a dimension independent inequality about functions. Um, and so it's uh, something which is quite useful um, when you're doing things in high dimensions. It's very nice to have inequalities which do not depend on the dimension. And in particular, what it sometimes allows you to do is, so here's an example. Um, if you have finite dimensional things which are independent of dimension, then you can use them maybe to say infinite dimensional uh, consequences. So this is maybe not the most general thing I could say, but let's, uh, let's say I take a Brownian motion. Uh, 
on uh, the interval zero one. Okay, so it's a Gaussian, but it has you know a lot of uh, it's, it's infinite dimensional and it has lots of uh, non-trivial uh, covariances. Okay. Um, and you also have concentration for certain functions of this Brownian notion, like, uh, so this is the classical one, which was uh, investigated by Christo Burrell. If I want to know what the maximum of the Brownian motion is, well, whatever it is, it's concentrated around its median the same way as the last thing, okay? Okay, so basically the, what this means is that if you wanna know what happens to the maximum of a Brownian motion, which could be have a, have a complicated distribution potentially, uh, it suffices to know what its median is because once you know what its median is, then you know uh, how well it concentrates around it. And this is actually something which is true for every Gaussian process. Um, okay. So uh, I'm sort of going backwards now, but let me tell you next the link between uh, this uh, concentration for Lipschitz functions and the uh, Gaussian perimeter Gaussian surface area business from before. And this is actually, uh, so it's, you know, if you go back to thinking about what my definition of Gaussian surface area was, it was about what's the infinitesimal increase in Gaussian measure as I expand the set. Right, so the Gaussian isoparametric inequality is an inequality telling you that infinitesimally your measure increases by a certain amount when you expand your set. And so it shouldn't be at all a surprise that if you have an infinitesimal inequality like that, then it also corresponds to a non infinitesimal inequality that you get by sort of integrating out the infinitesimal version. So let me state that next. Okay, so for every measurable set in Rn, uh, and for every h bigger than zero. So now I'm taking h bigger than zero instead of looking at uh, the limit as h goes to zero, which I did in the surface area. Okay, if I take the measure of the expansion of the set by h, uh, then this will be larger than a certain function of the original measure and h. So it's not a coincidence that if I take the right-hand side here and I differentiate an h, then I get back the function i, which was from the isoparametric inequality. Okay, so this last one, I'm gonna leave the proof as an exercise. And then using uh, this number three here, I'll show you how to get back to corollary one. just to make the connection between concentration of Lipschitz functions and expansions of sets. So the argument is actually very simple. Um, ah, I knew I was gonna do this. I forgot to, uh, okay, let me correct this. So the, I had an L Lipschitz function, but my L didn't appear in the conclusion. Okay, it appears like that. But in the proof, it suffices to take uh, L equals one to consider only one Lipschitz functions because an L Lipschitz function can just be written as a one Lipschitz function times L. And then you, uh, you just get the, the appearance of L here appears just by sort of homogeneity by that homogeneity there. So I'm gonna prove it for L equals one. And for L equals one, let me set A. So I have my function F and I take A to be the set of all X for which F of X is less than the median of F plus t. And now, so the, the first point is that my set A has measure a half, right? Because that's what the median is. It's the set of all, you know. The median is the thing where, oops, sorry. No, no, no. I, I didn't want the t there. So F, sorry, A is the set of all points where F of X is smaller than the median. Okay, and that's, uh, that has measure a half because that's what the median is, right? It's the number where if you take the set of things smaller than it, it has measure one half. 
Okay. Um, the other thing is that, uh, okay, let me write uh, like this. Okay. If I consider the set of all points that are bigger than the median plus some number, then this is contained, I claim, in the set of all points such that the distance from X to A is bigger than that same number. Right? It's maybe easier to understand this uh, in the contrapositive. So if I have uh, if I have a point which is within T of my set, then its value has to be within within T of the median, right? Because my function is Lipschitz. Okay. And so if you take that and you do the contrapositive, you get the inequality, the containment that I just wrote. And so you put that together and you get the probability that F is bigger than the median plus T is less than or equal to the measure of the set of all points whose distance from A is at least T. And another way to write that is it's the complement of A plus T B to N. Okay, and the complement, of course, has measure one minus the measure of the set. Okay, and according to corollary three, uh, the measure of the set, I have an upper bound, oh, sorry, I have a lower bound for it, but it has a minus sign, so it's an upper bound, one minus phi. Of, and here I should put phi inverse of the measure of A plus H but uh, the measure of A is uh, one half and phi inverse of a half is zero. So this is just H. Okay, and uh, phi is symmetric groups. In this way, one minus phi of H is phi of minus H, which is less than or equal to E to the minus H squared on two. And I just realized that I mixed up my T's and my H's. So I put that. T t squared on two, and so that's it. Okay. So from uh, expansions of sets to concentration of Lipschitz functions, the, the correspondence is just that the, uh, the expansion of the set is in the same metric with respect to which the function is Lipschitz. And so then you, you have uh, you know, being far away from the set is the same, or is related to, uh, to deviating in your Lipschitz function. OK. So let's see, that's corollary one and corollary three, I won't prove. I'll leave it as an exercise. Now, I don't know how inclined um, you are to do exercises for this winter, uh, winter school, but this, I think of all the exercises is an interesting one to do um, because it has two ingredients. So the first ingredient is uh, approximation of infinite dimensional by finite dimensional, right? You're supposed to take the Gaussian isoparametric inequality and figure out how to turn that into an inequality for this infinite dimensional process. And in doing so, you'll sort of understand why it's very important to be dimension independent in the sense that I was going on about. Um, and then the other thing is that uh, uh, in order to, to do corollary tree properly, you will need to understand uh, how to modify all of what I've been saying. Let's say, I'll under, say understand corollary one for non-standard Gaussians by non-standard, I mean non-identity covariance, right? Because your infinite dimensional process doesn't have an, an identity covariance and that doesn't even make sense. So you have to figure out uh, exactly what you have to do in order to make sense of all of this in terms of, uh, of uh, a different covariance matrix. Okay. And sorry, Joe, this yes. is for corollary two, right? Uh, yes, you're right. This is the one about Brownian motion, which Brownian, uh, yeah, yeah. was corollary two. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Okay. So uh, that was all that I wanted to say 
about uh, concentration from Gaussian isoprometric inequalities, because as I said, I think Radek will, will tell you much more about concentration from um, more a more modern point of view, I guess. What I want to do next is, is talk about a connection between Gaussian isoparametric inequalities and uh, things that are maybe more related to analysis, uh, functional inequalities, gradient bounds, that sort of thing. So maybe let me start a new page. Okay, so so the point here is that uh, the Gaussian isoparametric inequality is an inequality about sets, right? It tells you something about uh, you know how can a, how can a set look? Or how can a set be positioned in Rn? Functional inequality just means inequality is about functions, right? So it's going to be an inequality relating. Okay, so in this particular case, there will be inequalities relating functions and their gradients. Okay, um, and they turn out, well, I'll say more about uh, how they appear. Let me just write maybe the main theorem first. This is an inequality due to Bobkov. So get Bobkov in the 90s. Um, okay, I'm not going to write it in its most generous general form just to, to save on technicalities. But let's say I have a function on Rn taking values in 0, 1. And I'm going to ask for it to be Lipschitz, so that the gradient. To, I have no problem now in writing down the gradients. Okay, and then the inequality is. I take the expectation of f, and again, whenever I write expectation, it's with respect to the Gaussian measure, so the, the integral of f against the Gaussian measure, uh, and I take i, which again is the same isoparametric function. The Gaussian one-dimensional Gaussian density composed with the inverse of the Gaussian uh, cumulative distribution function. This thing is bounded by the expectation of the square root of i squared of f plus the gradient squared of f. Okay, so uh, I'm going to yeah okay. So this is the this is the inequality. Uh, I don't expect it to be very meaningful at first glance. It's telling you something about the values that your function takes and the gradient, right? Um, but I think maybe it makes a little bit more sense at first if I write down a weaker inequality. So just because the L2 norm is smaller than the L1 norm, I can bound this by the expectation of i plus the expectation of the gradient without the square. And then I rearrange this to get uh, I of the expectation minus the expectation of I is less than or equal to the expectation of the gradient. Okay, so it's a little bit more clear now which way the inequality goes around. Okay, because you see I is a concave function. And for concave functions, uh, let's see which way the instance inequality goes around. Uh, the concave function of the expectation is larger than the expectation of the concave function. So this is bigger than or equal to zero. Okay, so what this is really telling you, so first of all, if you have a constant function, then of course everything is zero, right? But what this is telling you is that if your function is sort of non-constant enough to make an inequality appear between, you know, in Jensen's inequality here, then it's also non-constant enough to give you a large gradient. Okay, so it's some sort of, uh, yeah, it tells you that if your function varies, in a measure theoretic sense, then it also has to vary in the sense of having a, a gradient. All right. Um, now, I'm also not going to prove this theorem to you uh, today, because what I want to do instead is talk about how it relates to the previous one. Okay, because there's uh, some connections here. Okay, so uh, let me first tell you how the isoparametric inequality. implies Bobkov's inequality. Maybe I should start that on a new page instead. Well, no, maybe not. I want to keep that here. Okay. So the isoparametric inequality implies Bobkov's inequality. And okay, I'm, I'm being a little bit sneaky here because it's actually the isoparametric inequality 
in Rn plus one will imply Bobkar's inequality in Rn. Okay, and so the way it goes is I take a function on Rn and I'm going to just uh, cheat a little bit by uh, making it take values in the open interval. And hopefully you'll, uh, you'll forgive me on this one if just to avoid a little minor technicality. Okay. Um, and I'm going to define a set, a subset of Rn plus one, uh, which is basically, well, okay, let me write it down. Um, so it's the set of all points. So I'm gonna write points in, in Rn plus one as x comma xn plus one, where the, the first x is the first n coordinates and the last one is the last coordinate. The set of all points where x plus xn plus one is less than or equal to pi inverse of f of x. Right. So this is just the it's like the the subgraph of uh, not the function but a phi inverse composed with the function. Right. So if my rn plus rn is here and my last r is there, then uh, my set is something of this form. Okay. And uh, okay. So what's the point of, of taking this set? So the point of taking this set is, well, okay. So first of all, the measure of this set in the n plus one dimensional Gaussian measure is easy because what I have to do is I have to just integrate, well, yeah, I mean, I do it by Fubini, right? I integrate along Rn, I integrate in this direction first, and then I integrate each of these one dimensional slices. Okay, so I integrate in Rn and then I integrate the one-dimensional slice and the one-dimensional slice, well, the measure of that, okay, so the set here is xn plus one uh, smaller than or equal to phi inverse of f of x, okay? And this inner integral is with respect to the one-dimensional Gaussian measure. And then the outer integral is with respect to the n-dimensional Gaussian measure, right? Because the Gaussian measure, again, it's a product measure. So this is the same as integrating the whole thing with respect to the n plus one-dimensional Gaussian measure. <laughs> And then uh, this inner integral is just f of x, right? Because again, this is what the function phi does for us, right? The probability, the one dimensional Gaussian probability of being smaller than phi inverse of something is just that something, right? So I get the integral over Rn of f d gamma n, which I prefer always to write just expectation of f. Okay, so I've constructed a set whose measure is the same as the expectation of my function. And the other thing about the set is that the Gaussian perimeter of this set, so now again, I'm gonna use this, uh, this fact that I told you left as an exercise that you can compute the Gaussian perimeter by integrating uh, the Gaussian density on the boundary. And the point is that, uh, okay, so the Gaussian density on the boundary, I'm gonna call, uh, okay, d gamma n plus one, dx, okay, and it's evaluated at the point in Rn plus one given by x comma f of x, because that's the point on the boundary, right? And not only that, but when I integrate on the graph of the function, there is a, a change of area term that I have to put in, which is the square root of one plus the gradient. Ah, sorry, uh, this is not f of x. The boundary of my set is phi inverse of f of x. Okay, so I have the gradient of phi inverse of f squared. And this is integrated uh, in Rn. So I'm integrating over the boundary of my set. My set is, the, the boundary of my set is the graph of a function. So I'm just integrating on the graph of the function. Okay, and now I just, uh, you know, compute this. Ah, sorry, 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 dx. The Gaussian density is, is already uh, accounted for here. Yeah. So I'm integrating the Gaussian density on the graph of my function. And now this gamma n plus one here is a product measure. So I split it into a gamma one and a gamma n. The gamma n 
basically turns my integral into an integral against the Gaussian measure. And the effect of gamma, well, it's just to introduce a one dimensional Gaussian density like that, right? So I've split my gamma n plus one into a gamma one on the left here and a gamma n on the right there. And uh, so now I have this uh, change of area term and uh, the gradient of a composition I can do, right? So this is the gradient of F divided by the derivative of phi, which is little phi composed with phi inverse, right? Okay, so that was just a little calculation there. And now you see this is I and this is I. So all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this I in front, I'm gonna put it inside the square root. Uh, it will give me something here and it will cancel with that I in the, in the denominator there. And I end up with the expectation of the square root of I squared plus the gradient squared. Okay, so this and this expression, I'll just scroll, scroll up because unfortunately I, I've lost it at the top here, is exactly the expression that appeared on the right-hand side of Bobkov's inequality, okay? So that's sort of if you, the, the geometric meaning, if you like, I mean, if, if you didn't understand uh, where this uh, funny expectation of square root so on came from when I wrote the ine original inequality, this is the geometric meaning, right? It's the surface area of the set that you get uh, from uh, from this construction. Okay, and now I'm ready to prove the theorem. So the Gaussian isoparametric inequality tells me that uh, the surface area, the, the perimeter, Gaussian perimeter of my set is bigger than I of its Gaussian measure in n plus one dimensions. Okay, and I just computed that this thing is equal to uh, I of the expectation and on the other hand, I also just computed that this thing is the expectation of the square root of I squared plus gradient squared, okay? So that shows uh, how you deduce Bobkov's inequality from the Gaussian isoparametric inequality in one dimension higher. Now, you can also go in the other direction from Bobkov's inequality to the Gaussian isoparametric inequality. So, I'm going to leave this one mostly as an exercise. The idea is, is very well, okay, let me, let me show you the, the not quite right hand wavy thing, right? So what I do is I, let me write down Bobkov's inequality for indicator functions. So I of the expectation of an indicator function, and I'm actually not going to write down the original Bobkov's inequality but the weakened version that I got by applying the L2, L1 bound, okay, I of uh, expectation of one A is bounded by the expectation of I of the indicator function. Now this is zero, right? Because uh, I is equal to zero when its argument is either zero or one and indicator functions only take values zero and one. Okay, and then the other term was the expectation of the gradient of the indicator function, okay. And you can think of the gradient of an indicator function as being like a Dirac mass in the unit normal direction to your set if it has a nice boundary. So this is basically like, you know, the integral of a Dirac against the Gaussian measure on the boundary. So, you know, very roughly, you can say that this should be equal to the, the Gaussian surface area. And the actual proof is an exercise. Um, make this rigorous. by approximating this indicator function with lip, using Lipschitz functions. Okay. So to go from the Bobkov inequality to the isoparametric inequality, it's really mostly just a matter of, of plugging in indicator functions for, for the functions that you're looking at. Okay, and, and this one, uh, actually keeps the dimension the same, right? This shows that if you know Bobkov's inequality in Rn, then you know the isoparametric inequality in Rn. 
Okay. So uh, this is maybe not completely satisfying because what it what we're left with right now is a picture that goes like this. So I have on one hand the Gaussian isoparametric inequality, and on the other hand Volkov's inequality. And let's say I look at you know n equals one, two, three, and so on. So Bobkov's inequality in Rn implies the Gaussian inequality in Rn, right? Um, okay. On the other hand, the Gaussian iso isoparametric inequality in Rn implies Bobkov's inequality in Rn minus one. So you have this sort of chain of implications going like this, right? But no cycles, right? So I haven't really been able to say that these two are equivalent exactly, but what I'm going to show you next is that Bobkov's inequality has this very nice property, which is very relevant for high dimensional things, that it tensorizes. And what I mean by tensorizes is that once you have Bobkov's inequality in dimension one, you basically get it for free in all higher dimensions. Okay. And the effect of that is, as far as the logic in this picture goes, is that you, you sort of close the cycle at least almost all of them, right? All of these things then become equivalent. Everything except for the Gaussian isoparametric inequality in dimension one, which turns out to be a genuinely easier thing. Okay, so basically, once I show you this tensorization step, it will suffice to prove the Gaussian isoparametric inequality in R2. Once you've proven it in R2, then it, it immediately follows in all higher dimensions, okay? Um, right. And all right, and in particular, I just wanted to point out that if, if you look at the statement of the Gaussian isoparametric inequality itself, it's a diff, it's, in principle, it's a different theorem for every n. Right? In, every, in every n in Rn, you have to show that the isoparametric sets are, are half spaces. Um, but uh, this argument here, this tensorization that I'm going to show you, is really uh, showing that Bobkov's inequality is, is very naturally a dimension independent inequality in a sort of, in a sort of easy way that uh, is not clear for the original set value inequality. OK, so let me show you this argument. It's just a couple lines. Okay, and basically what I what I'm going to claim is so tensorization of Bobkov's inequality. I'm going to show you that uh, Bobkov's inequality in R, if I assume that it's true in R, and I assume that it's true in R n minus one then uh, you get that it's also true in Rn, right? And then by induction, it's enough just to prove it in R, okay? So the argument goes like this. I start with a function in Rn, okay? And I start with the right-hand side, or whichever side, I forgot, maybe it was the left-hand side of Bobkov's inequality. And then I'm, I'm just gonna take this expectation and I'm gonna split it up by conditioning on the last coordinate. All right, so I hope the notation here is, is clear. I've got my Gaussian random vector Z or Z and Zn is the last component of it. Okay, and now the point is that what I have here inside now is a function on R it's just a function of one variable. So I'm going to apply my Bobkov's inequality for one, one dimensional functions here. And I get um, uh, expectation of the square root of I squared of the conditional expectation. This is my function of one variable that I've applied Bobkov to. And then I have, uh, well, it's okay. N. So it's the gradient of this function of one variable. Let me write it as uh, 
d by d z n squared, right? Okay, that's the result of applying a Bobkov's inequality to that one dimensional function, conditional expectation of f uh, given z n. And now I have again, maybe let me uh, erase that square and put it on the outside there. So I again have an I of some expectation. So now it's like I'm fixing my Zn and I am now, this expectation is now the expectation integrating over the other n minus one variables. Okay, and so I'm gonna apply Bobkov's inequality in n minus one dimensions inside here. And I get expectation of the square root. And then here I have expectation of the square root. And now in the inside I have I squared F. And then I have the gradient squared of this uh, uh, n minus one dimensional function, which I will write, hopefully the, the meaning of this is clear, the projection onto R n minus one of the gradient of F squared, right? That's just because, I mean, the, just I guess by Fubini, the projection of the, onto R n minus one of the gradient is the same thing as if I take the, uh, No, sorry, there's not Fubini here. There will be in a second. Okay, so that's what I get from applying Bobkov to I of the inner expectation. And I was squared, so I have to square this. And then I have the other term. And I have that big square root over the, over the top. Okay, and ooh, I missed a condition on the inside. Right, because that uh, inner application of Bobkov was with respect to the conditional measure. Right, so I have to keep the conditioning. Okay, and now I apply the elementary inequality, which is that uh, the L2 norm, well, let me write it like this, uh, the expectation of the square root of x squared plus y squared is bounded by uh, the square root of expectation of x squared plus expectation of y squared, right? just the convexity of the L2 norm of two things. And I'm going to apply that here to the inner expectation, right? Because it's a little bit hard to see with this mess notation that I have here, but it's the expectation of something squared. And also here, the expectation of something squared. So I get a bound. I pull all the expectations outside. I get the expectation of I squared of F and then I have the uh, first n minus one coordinates here of the gradient and uh, the last coordinate of the gradient, which of course I can put together to make the full gradient. Okay, and so by applying Bobkov's inequality twice for n equals one and for, uh, I shouldn't use n, okay, for dimension one and for dimension n minus one, you get back Bobkov's inequality for dimension n, okay? And that completes this picture that I drew here. So what we have is, um, the Gaussian isoparametric inequality and Bobkov's inequality are equivalent for all uh, dimensions two and higher. Okay. So that's one way of seeing where the uh, dimension independence of the Gaussian isoparametric inequality comes from. Okay, so next time what I'll start talking about is uh, a reversed version of, of Bobkov's inequality and which also has geometric consequences. Yes, so thank you for your attention.